Hello and welcome to episode 7 of the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast. I'm Dan Jennings and 10 years ago I gave up my life stream and career as a radio presenter with one big regret, never getting to interview my hero, the legendary British musician Paul Weller. This podcast exists purely to solve that issue. Welcome to Desperately Seeking Paul. Over the series, I'll be joined by fans and friends, the people who have worked with Paul from the early days of the jam to the Style Council, and then what is now a 20-year solo career. From In the City to Beat Surrender, from Speak Like a Child to Promised Land, from Into Tomorrow to More, and whatever comes next. We'll tell as many stories as we can from the fans, the friends, the collaborators and connections with one thing in common, a love of the music of Mr. Paul Weller. This week, I'm joined by author Ian Snowball, otherwise known as Snowy. He's published a bunch of great Weller-connected stuff over the years, the brilliant Paul Weller Sounds of the Studio book, some books with jam drummer Rick Buckler, and we talk about their friendship, which is an absolute joy, and 2021's new book on the Style Council called Soul Deep, which he created with our guest from episode one, Stuart D. Bill. Let's get into it. Hi, Snowy. How are you? I'm well, thank you very much. So I've just been for a run, so that's good. It's very cold outside. We had some snow here in Maidstone oh. uh, in Kent overnight, and there's um, bits of snows out there. So uh, being out there and uh, a bit of bit of fresh air and exercise has been fantastic. But um, that's done now. That's my exercise done for today. Now then, your name is somebody that comes up frequently in Paul Weller circles as somebody who is not only a, a huge fan of his work, but somebody who's kind of helping to tell the story um, around some of the biggest songs, the backstory, the interviews with some of the people who kind of work with him and stuff like that. So I'd love to kick off with just kind of understanding, you know, when did you first discover his music? I'm guessing it was the jam because that seems to be a huge passion point of yours. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in, um, I say Maidstone, Kent and um, the way our town was at the time, um, it was kind of divided into different areas. So you get kind of had like sort of the skinhead and punk lived in one area you know, and sort of the side of town I lived in was kind of a more of a strong hole for mods. And I had an older sister as well, sort of three or four years older than me. So her boyfriends tend to be more of the mod type. So some of them, lots of them are still friends now. So I kind of grew up in the side of town, in the youth club side of town, where um, the jukebox would play, you know, going underground and start stuff like this rather than... Um, some of the stuff that the skinheads and the punks were listening to. So yeah, that was it. And and then did people ever um, move across town? <laughs> what happened if you wanted well, to move house, but you actually your son was a, a punk? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Well, back then, as you know, I mean, any sort of sort of suburban town was a matter of. Um, I mean, I've written about it several times. You know, you could have Blakey's in your loafers or your brogues, yeah. you know, and, uh, and that click click clack clack as you walk down the street. But if you heard that click click clack clack, you never quite knew who was behind you. Was it a mod? <laughs> <laughs> or a skinhead or a rude boy because everyone had the you know the Blakey's in. Yeah, but then it was my eleventh birthday, that's entertainment. Um oh. had just come out. And I was given some money for my birthday and um and I have such a vivid memory of uh, walking down to Woolworths on a Saturday morning, you know, with fifty P and going into Woolworths when they had record when they were existed, you know, not just a record collection, and buying a copy um, with the, uh, the picture sleeve, you know, of um, That's Entertainment, which was just beautiful. I've been so excited, you know what I mean? This was the first seven inch I ever bought. This was the first seven inch, you know, so, you know, 11 years old, going into town by myself, buying this record, this seven inch record, racing home, racing up to my bedroom. I lived in the attic in our house, you know, um, it's called a converted sort of bedroom up there. Um, dropping to my knees, putting on the record player, getting it ready, taking it out of the sleeve, only to discover that it didn't have that little bit in the middle. <laughs> remember, the, remember the old yeah, yeah, sort of yeah. vinyl? Yeah, yeah. And um, <laughs> oh, no. yeah, so I couldn't play it. So I had to rush all the way back down to Woolworths, you know, to um, to find, uh, uh, to get that little black bit that goes in the middle. And I remember that so vividly, you know, That's so funny. vividly. But such you, were, I mean, you were lucky you had a cover because I, I, remember, I remember sometimes you queue up to kind of, um, we used to buy records from our local chemist. <laughs> It was I'll re- queue yeah, up, but like yeah, it wasn't yeah. even a boot. It was like the local chemist who queue up and get your seven inch on the day of release. And sometimes they weren't in the cover. It's just like a black sleeve with a hole in the middle. It's like, what's I, that I, about? I, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I know. And I, it's a shame that records don't have that kind of uh, visual um, impact anymore. You know, because obviously the seven inch reflected the album, didn't it? You know, all that kind of imagery. You know, but uh, but yeah, no. So that was my kind of um, entry point to the jam and Paul Weller really and I was surrounded by people that's what we that's what we played you know all that kind of stuff you know 
I loved what a, it. What a great one to kick off with as well. I mean, what an amazing song. I mean, that still stands up now. You hear that on the radio. I mean, I listen to Absolute Radio a lot, and you hear that a few times every single week on the radio. It's a great song, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And then many years later, when I got to know Rick, you know, I remember sort of going down one day with my little record, you know, um, and I actually had it framed for years in one of my old houses. I had the record, that my, my copy framed, because it was such an important record for me. And taking it down to Rick, you know, like it was some sort of like a holy grail, you know, item, you know, so, so, and ask him to sign it. Which I now got, you know. So um, nice. You know. So 1982. Maybe, maybe. How, how did you feel when that when Paul announced the split of the band and and that was the end of the jam? Yeah, I know. Um, I don't recall my feelings at the time, but I know I would have been disappointed, you know, and and gutted. But also, you know. I was a 12 year old kid, 13 year old kid at the time. I think I was, yeah, and just turned, and, and you know, there's other things going on. You know what I mean? Yeah, so there's other things going on. But yeah, it was it was hugely important. What I do recall, one of my pals at the time that we used to sort of see at discos around town, and he was a really cool guy, and uh, he had an, an older brother who was a mod who had a scooter and all this sort of stuff. Right? And I remember him telling me that. Um, his older brother and and that mob that they hung out with uh, went to one of the uh, one of the um, Wembley concerts, right? And I was so jealous, you know what I mean? Like mm. this this kid, you know what I mean? So jealous of my mate. And then it must be about five or six years ago. I remember being at um, a party with a lot of our crowd were there, and uh, I was going, "Hey, man, I've seen you for ages." And we sort of were living some memories, you know, after a couple of beers. And it was just like, I remember, like, you know, you were so lucky. You, you went to get to see the jam. He was like. I never got to see the jam. I said, yeah, but you told me about it. He said, no, bullshit. You know, um, all those <laughs> years. Yeah, I know, I know, amazing. So all those years, yeah, he never got to see the jam. So, but, <laughs> Absolutely but, rubbish, you know, brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> and then the Style Council obviously has become a, a big part of your life. Um, the, the book, Soul Deep, if it's not out already, it's out very soon, depending on when, when we're releasing this. But I, I chatted with Stuart about Soul Deep, the book, um, in episode one, and obviously the collaboration between the two of you. I mean, it looks incredible. What a beautiful, beautiful products i guess or, or publication i can't wait to get my hands on it i've only had a sneak preview from a little pdf at the minute so i can't wait to get the actual thing but the style council obviously was was equally as big for you absolutely now i mean that's the thing i mean as, as much as i love the jam and they are my go-to band you know um so my entry point would would have been 1980 because that's when sound effects came out and and that's entertainment and so forth and so i had to sort of go back to the jam, you know, setting suns and all more cons and all that sort of stuff. And 1977 within the city in the modern world L would have been a lot, would have seemed like a long time back for a kid of my age, you know, but when the style council come along, which was very, you know, very, very soon after the jam split, you know? So, um, I remember the excitement of that. So though I don't remember the necessarily the feelings of the jam split, I remember the excitement of the style council forming. You know, because I guess my awareness was um, more aligned to that at the time. And I loved it. You know what I mean? I loved the first single. I loved the fact that um, when I looked a certain way and it was, I just remember it being hugely exciting, you know, really, really excited. And the other thing was the Star Council, unlike the jam, I was able to buy each record as it came out, you know, so... They were part of the sort of the, the fabric of my existence at the time, you know, whereas the jam were, were kind of until the end, sort of like last hour and so forth, were different, you know. But the Style Council was, it kind of walked beside me through my teenage years in a different way. That makes nice. sense. You know? I love that, how you put that. Um, and that's interesting, actually, because you kind of think of people discovering his music now. So at least when you discovered the jam, there were, what, maybe, what was it, three albums before that, probably four albums before that? Whereas yeah. now, if you're discovering Paul Weller today, you've got, I don't know, what is it, like 35 albums, probably? <laughs> that's like, <laughs> imagine having to wade through that. I mean, it's brilliant. What a great experience. But wading through that back catalogue is incredible. Uh, absolutely. And, and I remember sort of going to see the um, the Star Council down Brighton. Um, my dad was a postman and there was a young postman there that um, somehow sort of told my dad, you know, he was into the Star Council or Paul Weller or whatever, you know, and he said it would be okay to take me to a gig, you know, down Brighton Centre. And that, I think it would have been about 84 or something, wasn't it? Um, so that kind of period, Brighton Centre, which is still one of my favourite venues. Yes, you know, I love yeah. sort of, you know. Great venue, I've yeah. Seen, yeah, yeah, I've seen Weller there many times since. Uh, always had good times, love Brighton. But having that experience of seeing the Star the Star Council on stage, you know, and, and feeling like you're in the same room, you know what I mean, of this person that's been in your life for these 
so many years before and Steve White it was just it was just great I'm just and I have very very vivid memories of that particular concert as well and the feeling of that and being around a lot of older kids and a lot of people listening to live music Star Council music was amazing Did you follow them all the way through? Was there kind of an end period where you kind of because obviously we know that sales kind of started to kind of I'll use the phrase dwindle I guess around kind of towards the latter days of the Star Council hence the kind of split from Polygon and things like that but was there a time where you kind of not fell out of love but maybe you kind of were as keen on the stuff or did you kind of go do you know what I love the house album well, well this is the, the irony really because I was um, I got heavily into the, the house acid house thing you see that was very much a part of my existence and so from 88 onwards you know my um, my interests lay elsewhere you know um, so but by the time Confessions came out which I got I don't remember, I don't recall it having a huge impact on me because I was into other things, you know, at that age, you know, you could sort of go out legally drinking and stuff like that, you know. So by the time the last album come around, which obviously didn't come out at the time, and I don't recall it at the time, I remember obviously Promised Land and everyone's on the run, but they were a footnote, you know, they weren't. So, yeah, so by that point, they weren't of interest and I certainly don't even remember the concerts at the Royal Albert or the concert at the Royal Albert or whatever because I was raving in some field off the end of the <laughs> by that point. So, yeah, yeah, live, live music wasn't on the radar, you know, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do have the album now and I do like the album, you know, and, um, and I kind of see it for what it is, you know. I think in, um, we'll come on to your other book, which is Sounds from the Studio, and I think... Um, which I love. I think it's, you know, this kind of idea that you can kind of have a chapter on every single album of, of the solo career, kicking off from Saturn's Pattern and going all the way back through his kind of solo years, every every chapter being a different album, and then through the Star Council and the Jam and stuff. So I love this. Yeah, I mean, one of the things about that particular book, and so it happened at the time when that um, Saturn's Pattern had come out, and what had happened was, I read the sleeve notes, all right, because on, on the CD, you know, you get like rather than a vinyl album, you, they, they were able to sort of put more information in, you know. Mm, yeah, you get and, a book on it. Uh, yeah. And I remember reading a sleeve note, and um, Weller had written something in there about Frankie Knuckles, the great DJ, the great you know, New York, Chicago guy, right? Godfather of house music. And Frankie had not long died. It was either the same year or, 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 or the year before, I can't recall now. And I thought, wow, you know, one that Weller had sort of you know, mentioned Frankie Knuckles was kind of interesting to me, being a big house fan myself. And then I started reading through the other sleeve notes on the other albums and what it kind of told me or showed me, and it's kind of obvious when you think about it, you know, whoever's in Weller's life any particular time, you know, gives credit to, whatever, musicians, Mm. wives, you know, the studios he's working at. And the sleeve notes told a little story on their own. And I thought, well, that's really, really fascinating when you go through 15, 20 years, you know, it shows this um, this journey. So I grabbed all the all the CDs and the albums, you know, and I just started reading through this stuff, you know, and I thought this would make an interesting book to sort of hang something around, you know. So that's where it came in. And I thought the obvious thing would have been to do is start with the jam and then chronologically just go through everything. And that's been done and great. But at the time, my mind was more into that, that particular album that's solo work and I thought let's start there and work back you know what I mean something different you know and it kind of kind of worked but what that did for me was to pick out every song and every album which I'd heard dozens of times hundreds of times depending on that particular song you know and I'd heard them when I started to study them for the purposes of getting information to write about you kind of start to listen to them in different ways, you know? And what I started to find, I started to hear things in there that I'd never heard before. Mm-hmm. The detail started to present itself, you know, um, and come to the forefront. And I thought, I never heard that bass line played like that. I never heard that that backing vocal. I never heard. So then you start to think about all these different people that contributed to these records, you know? And that's why that book came about. It was, you know, rich, literally the sounds from the studio. All the stuff that goes into making an album, which is a huge, huge deal. And musicians that do sort of stuff like that would, would know that and appreciate that and understand that. Um, but I thought for the reader, that book might sort of trigger an opportunity to go back and listen to some of those songs, Dan, and, and listen to them with different ears, you know, like yeah. you start to see something with different eyes. And I loved it. And I loved in that book together because like you, I'd headphones on because you hear things in, you know, in a different yeah. way, you know, and literally spending, well, would have been hundreds of hours, really, you know what I mean, putting together the research and the writing of that particular 
particular book and I really really enjoyed it and then of course the interviews as well you know, well so I was going to say about the interviews but the other thing I think that I, I love about it is it's, it's the, the fact you're kind of dissecting bits of the song and how it's kind of made up and, and the album how it's made up but I think it's also a lovely insight into the different studios as well so we talk about Black Barn we've talked about quite a lot on this podcast already but the, the idea of him being uh, um, I think Heliocentric was the album and that was um, Chris Difford's studio I think in in somewhere on the south coast if I recall rightly the manor I think it's called in Oxfordshire and stuff so it's, there's all these kind of different studio experiences which you then discover kind of that, that feel of the studio comes through in the album as well like you say and the different technicians people like Simon Dine and his input on some of those albums and, and Steve Craddock's been such a big kind of part of, of obviously the weather world but when you start kind of reading the book you realise what a big part he had to play in some of those albums and those songs too so the interviews kind of and the, and the facts about the studios and stuff all, all kind of brings this whole story to life and gives you so much more about each song and each album it's lovely I think so. I mean, and one of the things I was fortunate with that book was um, I kind of presumed, rightly or wrongly, that um, Weller might not give it the support that he did if it was an, another book, you know, about him and the Jam Star Council, you know. But what I did kind of think was that he may sort of like the idea it's about the music and about the songs because that's what he does you know and uh and, and in the end he did you know the foreword is very much about that you know or, or the or sort of the, you know that's that sort of q a i had with him was sort of just getting inside that really and he credits a lot of musicians and arrangers and so forth in the stuff that he wrote in that book you know and that was really important there and sort of reflected what the book was about because um yeah i know steve craddock you know and um was sort of saying they don't spend too much time analysing the, the guitar they're playing, you know what I mean, or this, you know, and, and it was never meant to be an, an anorak-type book because that's not me. I won't remember that stuff anyway, you know. But the stuff they did use, equipment-wise, did contribute to the songs, you know, so that's important as well, you know. Yeah. So, it, yeah, it kind of worked out all right. Uh, so the book came out, I think, was it 2015 and was, and like you said, work, works backwards, so kind of Saturn, Saturn's pattern. But since then, we've had three studio albums and a live album so two questions on that I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself I'm so excited about this conversation but um, one when you listen to these new albums do you do that through a different ear now so are you kind of doing that unpicking analyzing reading those notes and whatever and question two is where's the update because we need we need to know because these albums are so forward thinking so you know experimenting in the studio that that story continues to be fascinating yeah and that's the that's the beauty of and one of the things which hopefully um, Paul Weller fans can still accept is that you know whatever he he, he delivers is this where he is at that particular time and I kind of respect that I admire that and I'm, I'm okay with that I know some people struggle with that and that's okay too you know um, so yeah with regards to some sort of follow up it has crossed my mind of course you know but that would be something ten, a, a decade away you know what I mean because 10 years from yeah. now we're probably going to have another five albums or something yeah. you know so that would be really interesting to do but yes and also the, going back to the thing you raised yes I do listen to Paul Weller's music now with a different kind of different ears, you know, looking for different things in there. And and when you do that, it does reveal things and you think, yeah, that's where he is today. Yeah, that's good. You know, that's mm. all right. I would love to read the next one because it's kind of like the, the influence of people like Hannah Peel recently in terms of the orchestration on things like True Meanings and some of the stuff on Sunset. I'd love to, you know, I'd love to know how that works and the kind of collaboration and stuff. So as part of your interviews, it must have been as a fan, it must have been kind of fascinating just to understand how these kind of these people that you've loved the music of kind of work up this these things and these sounds and this, this, this and contribute to this. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm a musician myself, you know, so, um, so, you know, I'm, I'm always very curious in that studio process because it's a wonderful thing. Um, and one of my favorite places to be is in that studio type bubble and to see how a song gets created, you know, gets made, evolves and so forth. And any insight into into Weller's world is always of interest, you know. Um, I mean, for example, I remember the day that the interview was set up with Noel Gallagher. By that time, Stu and I had, had already done the Oasis book, but we couldn't engage Noel or Liam at all. It just right. wasn't for whatever reason, you know. So that came and went with the Oasis book. But what, three or four years later when I'm doing the Paul Weller one, um, he agreed to, to sort of talk about, you know, playing on those records, you know. And it was a great experience. I, don't, I never met Noel before that point. And it was a great experience, um, but also very insightful, you know, just in terms of how they put together records and how natural and organic it is for them. So when I hear those records that Noel plays on, that stuff always comes to my mind, you know? So if someone reads that book, they hear those stories in there. 
you know, walk and give splinters, for example, you know, when, when well is sort of um, asking now about Dr. John, does he know the original track and all that? I remember Noel now can see Noel sat in front of me sort of going away like, yeah, 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 it's great. I know exactly. <laughs> and then, and then the next one he says, I don't got a fucking clue. He's on about me. You know, I've got no <laughs> idea. It's the great blag, isn't it? You know, but, um, but these are the people we're around, you know, so it's, it's great from that standpoint that the real stories. But it's also that talent to, I guess it's, it's that confidence thing or an arrogance. I don't know, but you know, to be able to wing it because ultimately, you know, I could go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then <laughs> what am I going to be playing? I've got no idea. Presumably, he didn't kind of have a crack at it and then well ago, you don't know the song. It's like actually, he's, he's worked it out and figured it out, and, and it sounds great. Absolutely. And, and Noel Gallagher, you know, he, he's, he's, he's a brilliant musician. Of course he is. He's own right and songwriter, as we know, you know. He did say to me that he's been on stage with Wella. Um, which some of us would have been at concerts, you know, and where well, pulls him on and Noel's playing his guitar and says, uh, and then Noel's actually said to me, he says, what he does, he turns his guitar right down because he doesn't know the songs, you know <laughs> what I mean? So he just turns up. So, the, but these are things that are, you know, are just things, aren't they? You know, they're just... Yeah. Um, I love that. So am I right in thinking you're mates with Rick? Rick has become, I spoke to him actually just a couple of days ago. Um, yes, Rick has become a very dear friend. It, yeah, lo- lovely bloke on so many levels. He came to my wedding a few years ago. He's been my house many times. I've been in his house many times. Well, I think I've done like four books of him now, you know what I mean? So yeah. you kind of get to know someone in a, in a certain way. Um, I presume you've run out of questions about the jam with him now, because <laughs> there's obviously, like you say, those books, you know, that's entertainment um, was one of them you, that you, you wrote together. There must be, do you talk about the jam much or is it more kind of like you've got that all out of your system and now it's just normal stuff you talk about lockdown and things like the rest of us brexit yeah uh, yeah no, no, well you, yeah you, nowadays um it's just to talk about normal stuff yeah you know that that kind of um pressing in for inside information you know it's kind of gone now but yeah. but then part of our relationship is i was never like that anyway with him you know it was um it was two people talking about something that was important to both of us in different ways and with rick you get a very um genuine approach and a down-to-earth approach to things putting together his autobiography was an amazing experience and for me holds up as probably the the go-to book on the jam only because you know or because you know it's written by a member of the jam you know so the kind of insight to it which can only come from those three people that were in the band you know yeah and at the moment we only have rick's book to tell us that story you know as he experienced it and the beauty thing is you know they, Bruce and Paul could all and Rick could all talk about the same thing and perceive it and experience it differently. That's yeah, that's, that's humans, isn't it? So yeah, so that time with Rick was just a great experience. It would be a matter of me with my dictaphone just wandering down to his house, or he'd come to my house, or we'd go down to his local boozer and have a bite to eat and spend a couple of hours just talking about you know the next part of the book you know the next part of the jam or whatever and his life you know and it was as natural as that so just a conversation which you know then we put together as a as a book and um it was very it was was a good thing to do it was a great thing to do and obviously that's an incredible story all around in terms of you know the, the the work the amount of work they had to do the kind of tiny clubs that they were kind of playing to next to nobody or to kind of these um, these British legions kind of clubs when they were like 15 and stuff. It's kind of, you know, it's just incredible the amount of effort they kind of put in and the work they did to kind of get to the point of, in the, even just to get to the point of in the city, let alone that's entertainment when you kind of discover them. Is it, was it just, the mileage was amazing. Absolutely. They were a hardworking band. It was, um, I think Paul sort of mentioned this. I know Rick has sort of told me, I said, I don't know Bruce's feelings, but... Um, the fondest memories is, is of that period before they kind of broke. It's interesting because I've kind of heard that from other musicians and other bands. It's, it's that that period, you know, before it gets taken over by something else, you know, there's a kind of, um, I don't have that experience, you know, I don't, I mean, it's, it's got to be an experience that only a few people can have, but that graft, that all being young and in a van driving up and down the motorway you know just doing that stuff was um yeah rick talks very fondly of that sort of time you know yeah. so i think paul's referred to it as well so well it's that idea of being a dreamer at that point as well isn't it because it's kind of like you know you've got no idea where this story is going to end up in terms of you know your career and whether you're going to make it ever you know there's so many people out there wanting to be you know musicians and play to audiences and all that yeah it's kind of that dreamer mentality of just kind of like we can do this we can do this and that must have been so exciting such fun absolutely and i guess for them the timing like all these sort of successful stories is is, is often about the timing of something and that you know pub rock was coming to its um its natural conclusion and punk was coming in and they were able to sort of the jam you know, 
including their songwriting, their influences from the Kinks, from Motown, from whatever, with that sort of punk punkiness that was going on, you know. Um, so I guess it must have been very exciting as a songwriting band, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I recommend any Jam fan to read Rick's book because it really is just a really, 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 really good book. You know, it's, just, it's a great story. Now, the other one you'd recommend or I would recommend as well is Thick of Thieves, which is, again, you and Stuart, I think I'm right in saying, which is kind of like these kind of personal experiences of the kind of that journey from a fan's point of view as much as any other. Um, and I think this is kind of what's so exciting for me about this podcast already, kind of seeing the reaction on kind of Twitter and people kind of just talking about the gigs they've been to and the songs they love and all that. That must have been just lovely to kind of put together and kind of look at actually what everybody's feeling about this band. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, personal situations with the band and whatever that means, you know, it's um, a 15-year-old kid today can pick up Setting Suns or something, you know, and the world, you know, will change, something will happen, you know. Um, in the same way that I picked up Beatles albums. I wasn't there, you know, when they were going, you know. Yeah. But it, it can be incredibly important uh, and impactive. So Thick as Thieves was a fantastic thing to do, great experience to do. For Stu and I, it made perfect sense because um, he and I were just two fans, like so many, the Jam Army, you know, as it's referred to, who were involved and influenced by such a incredible band that this had so much meaning you know so much emotion and feeling and a soundtrack you know to to the teenage years you know all this kind of stuff so the, the depth of it was just amazing and i read i mean i personally i read a lot of biographies and autobiographies you know so i'm interested in people and people's lives and what thicker c's done was just show all these people that we had this common denominator with and, and often similar experiences. And yeah, it was a bit of a nostalgia kick, but that's all right. Mm. Um, a lot of the books I do is a nostalgia thing, you know. For me, it's um, I'm good with that. I enjoy it. And I think people enjoyed writing or being interviewed about something that happened to them 30, 40 years before um, because it was just so important and was so important so many years later. So it was great. Plus all the photographs that went yeah. with it, the interviews. It was, it was again, it was, it was great. You know, it's, it's telling the stories. It's, it's a history lesson. You know? Yeah, no, it's lovely. And I think, and I think that point you say about people discovering it now. So I mean, for me, that was the same, exactly the same experience for me. For my first experience of well, was hearing "Aha, oh yeah" on the radio and loving it, and not and being like, "Oh, this is new guy, <laughs> this new guy, Paul Weller is amazing." And we had some decorators in our house at the time. I was like, "Oh, you, you know, it's a recommendation." for his songs called Aha, oh, yeah and they're like oh yeah who's that fun it's like this oh this new guy Paul Weller they're like yeah yeah mate <laughs> next day he brought in a cassette of the jams greatest hits it's like here you go have a listen to that that's well mate and um yeah god wow, wow what an opening that was you know to me and, and, and exactly that same thing I would have been a 16 year old kid at that point um suddenly discovering all this this amazing material from the jam and then the style council later so it's exactly right and I love a history lesson like that what a, what a there should be more history lessons like that going on in school quite frankly two final questions for you um so you've got one Weller song that you're allowed for the rest of your life only one left which one are you going to go for uh, and that's across the jam and the star council yeah that's one where you, yeah, yeah you can't I have mean, one from each year <laughs> no 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 it would it would uh, it, it, it would be that's entertainment for me you know without a doubt uh, so it has such meaning the timing of it the connection is just a wonderful thing. Um, so that's entertainment is always something that has a, a, a very dear and fond place in my, in my heart. So yeah, Lovely. absolutely. Good choice, good choice. Or I could always, I'd always be happy to listen to that one, quite frankly. Um, and then final question is, um, obviously the aim of this podcast is to get a, a meeting with Paul Blackburn, chat for oh, you know, a few hours, just you know, talking about his music, his life and, and the future. What question should I ask? Is there one thing that you, you're dying to know still in this, uh, having spent time with him still, produce all these books and stuff? There must be something you want to know. I, I mean, the thing, I suppose where I am at the moment, um, as an example, there's a magazine called Faith Magazine, all right, um, which is just about to come out. Uh, the front cover has got Paul Weller on it. Uh, there's an interview with Paul in there, which someone's done. But the magazine's about house music, you see. Ah, so right. someone was able to get an interview with Paul about house music, which I've tried a couple of times and not been able to get. My question would be for him to really sort of get his understanding of what he liked about that, that house music, you know. It, um, so, yeah, because I never had the opportunity to sort of get that. That would be my thing. And you do see those bits coming into his, his music occasionally, like things like um, One Tear with Boy George recently. Yeah, I thought it was a fantastic song. Absolutely. I thought it was absolutely brilliant, you know. And I say, never saw this thing that he wrote about um, Frankie Knuckles that's, uh, that's always stuck with me. And I thought, oh, yeah, I'd like to have a conversation with Paul over a cup of tea 
about his interest. Um, that sort of house music means to him. So, Hey, Snowy, good luck with Soul Deep as well. Um, I can't wait to kind of get my hands on that. Thank you so much for your time. This has been an absolute joy and um, I really appreciate it and all the best. Dan, thank you very much. Always good to talk about him. So good luck with everything and um, yeah, take care. All right. Cheers then. That was so great. Thanks to Snowy. Check out his books online. Search Ian Snowbill. Add on Paul Weller. You'll find all the details. And just a reminder to make sure you subscribe on your podcast channel for future episodes. Leave us a review as well. It gets us up the charts, you know. Give us a retweet and help to spread the word on Twitter too, at WellerFanPod. Plus, keep your eyes peeled for episode eight, which lands very soon with a fabulous singer-songwriter called Teenage Waitress, otherwise known as Daniel J. Ash. Another huge fan of Paul's. He supported him on tour, recorded at Black Barn Studios, otherwise known as Weller HQ, and he has some fabulous stories to tell. Until then, stay safe and thanks for listening.